Hey guys, it's Adam from Lucid Pixel and welcome back. Today I come to you with something a little bit more practical. The reason being, a fellow YouTuber reached out to me recently and asked for some feedback on some of his videos. And after listening to and being hugely impressed by this YouTuber's message, what he was sharing in terms of his thoughts and his feelings and the stance he took publicly, um, I felt compelled to offer him some constructive feedback, both technically and professionally, because as a fellow YouTuber, as a fellow artist in the industry who also works every day really hard to get my message out there, I've learned through some experience how to make sure that that message is properly received at the other end and that there aren't any undue distractions or I'm not making any silly mistakes that can, can create the opposite reaction or the opposite effect of what I'm looking for. Now, I'm not saying that's what this YouTuber did and I'm not linking him just for privacy's sake. I want to respect his privacy, but, um, um, but all of these elements were important to mention in response. So today I'm going to offer you a little bit of practical, a little bit of technical advice, but mostly professional advice on how to build a name for yourself properly from the perspective of somebody who's made mistakes and knows which ones to avoid. From the perspective of somebody who understands where you're going to very possibly, most probably end up to make sure you get there as quickly as possible so you can build beyond the advice that I'm offering you today. And develop your brand and develop your audience. Let's get something straight. Let's get straight to brass tacks over here. Art and the artistic career can be challenging. Artwork can be challenging. The career can be challenging. Developing a name, dealing with the politics of different companies, getting paid, uh, what to charge for your work, getting clients that try to jip you from, from payment or, or just companies that are just cheap and don't pay artists well enough. The list goes on and arguably this these challenges are not always exclusive to artwork i mean i've known programmers and engineers that suffer just as much so professional being professional and working in a professional world and dealing with politics and dealing with corporations and all this kind of crap can be challenging it can be frustrating it can be difficult but when you go public with your opinion, when you're sharing your message with your audience, how you share your positive and or negative feelings can have a direct impact on how your audience receives it, how willing they are to listen. And furthermore, you can do so in a way that does not burn professional bridges on your way down the line. And a perfect, amazing piece of advice that I got that I've learned uh, was from the acting for animator teacher Ed Hooks. I've had the I've had the honor of meeting him on two occasions. Uh, once, one when he taught a workshop at the school that I taught at, organized by one of the students at in my animation department. And the other time was I went to a workshop and he just happened to be there. Um, and both times it was a hugely fun experience and an amazingly eye-opening experience. He's taught, Ed Hooks has written, the, he wrote the book Acting for Animators, which is a, a mandatory read for anybody in the arts. Um, and um, he's taught, he's done workshops for Blizzard and Pixar and Disney and you know, Blue Sky and you name it. He's, 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 he's been to all the big ones. And one of his core messages when it comes to storytelling and how you deliver this information is you cannot maintain your audience's engagement through sympathy. What you want to use instead is empathy. And for any of you who, who haven't really given those two different terms any too much thought and have have explored the distinctions between these two. Sympathy is based off of pity. Okay? It's based off of pity alone. Empathy is based on keeping your audience feeling what you're feeling. And it can be positive or negative. It can be anything. 
but it's a way of keeping them on your side and keeping them along for the ride and not just being willing or usually unwilling recipients of your bitching or your whining and complaining. And this can apply to any situation whatsoever. It can be tragic, it can be sad, it can be difficult. But if you try to drag on sympathy for too long, there is only so much of that that other people can live with. And I would argue this is as much of a life lesson as it is a professional lesson. Until eventually they just can't offer you any more sympathy. People's sympathy for you and your plight and your struggles is finite no matter how bad it is. Sympathy loses you. Empathy engages you. When you, when you watch a movie, 99% of the time, they're going through some hard shit, right? But they're not sitting, as soon as they sit there going, oh my God, my life sucks. And everything is just terrible. And I just, it's just, it's just nobody cares about me. You know, I like my daddy only gave me like a hundred grand. And I'm like, he doesn't love me anymore. I was like, shut the fuck up. You know, it's like, ugh. And you don't feel sorry for those idiots, but when somebody's legitimately going through a hard time, but they're trying not to put that burden on you and they're being strong and they're smiling through it, you are there and you will lavish them with, with as much love and support as possible. Empathy versus sympathy. Okay. So when it comes to you sharing your thoughts, sharing your rants and complaints online about your experiences, which I do all the time, right? Package it in a way that doesn't sound like you're whining about it because nobody gives a shit when you whine. You're losing your audience through basically just wanting people to feel sorry for you and having putting people in a position of feeling sorry for you is selfish. There's no, there's, you're not giving anything back when you're whining. You're just complaining and people get sympathy fatigue very, very quickly. Humans are not designed emotionally designed to listen to people complain incessantly for no reason, unless there's a point at the end of it. No, that's not to mean, you know, if something really pisses you off and somebody did something really messed up and you were really screwed over and you want to make sure that's a public thing, complain about it. But always try to complain about it in a way of saying, you know what, I really wish for something to change and something to improve in the industry or what would you do in my position, I feel I want to be able to get over this. I need your help to get help me get over this. It's packaging it in a way of saying, I'm not giving up. I'm pissed off, but I'm not giving up. What can I do to handle this the best way? Because I don't feel I have it in me to do it. You're basically sharing exactly that same message, but you're sharing it in a way that doesn't force people to just sit down and listen to you complain and then turn it off because nobody wants to do that, right? So remember, very important, don't just complain for the sake of, or at least be aware of whether or not what you're saying sounds like you're just, you're just throwing a pity party versus somebody who's legitimately addressing something in the industry that needs to be fixed and either you're offering your feedback or you're reaching out to your audience for that. That creates an, an environment for, of empathy and that is something people will, won't only want to be engaged in, that might even engage them more than usual because we can empathize with that. I feel it too. And that creates a camaraderie between you and I, right? You're creating a rapport with your audience and that's a very powerful thing. Now, this next thing I want to address is something that I am hugely guilty of. Um, and I would argue artists in general have a tendency to suffer this malady quite a bit. And that is our mouth is faster than our brain, <laughs> right? Or maybe, or maybe it's the opposite. Our brain's faster than our mouth. We go off on tangents and you know me, if you've known me for longer than two weeks, you know that I go off on tangents, right? But how you pace what you say and what you're focusing on when you're sharing a message is really important. The reason being is if you trail off topic and never bring it back to your core message or core messages, what you're doing is again, fatiguing your audience's brain with too many things they need to focus on. And if you do that again, your audience is going to tune out. So if you're the type of person 
who starts on a subject and then, you know, a butterfly walks by. So you go, ooh, butterfly, and you chase after them. And then you accidentally get hit by a car. So you spend the next half hour yelling at the guy for being a reckless driver. And that makes you think about engineering cars. So then you, you call your friend and, tell, and get into a conversation about car building. And then when during that, they talk about car seats and that reminds you of a couch and you go, oh yes, I forgot I had to go to Ikea. And that was the reason you left, left your house in the first place because you were gonna go, go to Ikea to buy a couch and then when you got to ikea you forgot about the fact that you were supposed to buy a couch and you ended up coming home with a desk how the hell did i end it up here right then yes i can relate to you but the problem with that is in going off on all that tangents can you remember the first thing i was talking about and don't be a smart ass and say i was talking about tangents yeah we get that okay <laughs> going off topic too much will kill the message. It'll kill the core message. And whenever you're sitting down to talk with your audience, bring yourself back. Always bring everything back to what that core message was about. If you trail off topic, that's fine. But find a way of tying it back because if you don't, A, you've lost your audience and B, people are gonna feel like you just wasted their time. What the hell are you talking about? You, your video says how to be a better YouTuber and here you are talking about fitness training. You lost me. I feel gypped a little bit. It feels almost like clickbait at that point. People get annoyed with that. So bring yourself back to that point of focus. Now in that, in this focusing headspace, there's also pacing. And I'm saying this in the face of a lot of very famous YouTubers. <laughs> you look at YouTubers like Jenna Marbles, you look at Philip DeFranco, you look at, or, or you know, or, or uh, um, What's her face? Colleen Ballinger. I'm all, they're, they're always playing in my house. I've got a bunch of, you know, my, my girlfriend and my kids are always w watching them and stuff like that, as am I very often. They create their tempo, their pacing, their editing always cuts out empty space, right? So there's always a back-to-back-to-back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back -to -back -to -back dialogue. There's no pause in between. If you've got somebody who can, who can play around with your with your tonality and play around with your your energy level, then that can maintain a nice flow that keeps people engaged. Like Jenna Marbles, for instance. I don't get fatigued listening to Jenna Marbles as much because she throws in jokes, she, she does little sarcasms here, she does silly things. Sometimes you're focusing on her putting on her 85th eyelash, right? Um, but if you listen to like Philip DeFranco, who's a very popular YouTuber, I can't listen to more than one one video because I get so irritated that I click it off because I'm like, oh, it's so, you feel so bombarded with this tempo and this vibration of voice that it's like, <gasps> I can't take it anymore. It really fatigues me. Not everybody, but you can see where I'm going with this. It becomes noise. I just want him to shut up at a certain point. And I love that guy. I love his videos, but I just want him to shut up. I, I literally start to grit my teeth after a while. If you're sharing a message with somebody, I say, if you really want people to remember and listen and focus and take away something of value, think more professionally. And my argument is that the common how to get clicks, how to get subs recipe for keeping people mentally engaged, because basically what you're really providing them with is background noise because they're bored and you're aware of this and that's your brand, Philip DeFranco's brand is not the news, it's background noise, okay? It really is. Listen to all of these different YouTubers. 99% of what they talk about, you'll forget about five minutes later if you're even paying attention. It's background noise. But listen to Let Me Know, L-E-M-M-I-N-O. Listen to Vadavidia. Listen to David Attenborough. Listen to Stephen Fry. Listen to any of these speakers that are sharing important messages, that are respected for their intelligence, that are respected for their stance, that when they say something, you stop and pay attention. Pay attention to their pacing. Notice that when I slow down and put emphasis on the word pacing, it's stuck in your brain. 
But if I'm talking about pacing and I keep going off on this tangent and we're talking about this and we're talking about that and today I'm going to be talking about this and tomorrow we're going to be talking about that and here in this particular case, we're going to be doing this and we're going to be doing it like that and here's the way I'm going to do this and this is the way I'm going to do that and this is the way that they do it and I don't care what they do, but you know what? My personal stance is we're going to... Okay, I'm sure you can tell that you get lost in that. It's too much. You're numbing the brain. You're numbing the senses. Pace yourself. Don't be afraid to stop. Because when you do, you're giving your audience's brain a second to retain that information and go, oh, I think he wanted me to pay attention to that. Okay, stop. I got that. Good. What's next? I'll give you an example of where I learned this. I didn't learn this from YouTubing. I learned it when I was a broke artist and I had no money and I took whatever goddamn job I could find. And this particular job was doing phone surveys. Yes, telephone surveys where I was crammed into some, what you could call a call center. It was literally a room with a bunch of phones in it, <laughs> you know, the headsets. And there was about 60 of us crammed into a room that I think was intended for four people. And I put this headset on and we would wait and the phone would auto dial. It would auto dial whatever's in the phone book and whoever, whichever random person answered the phone, I would start my pitch. But it was phone surveys and the phone would beep and I would say, hi, my name is Adam Duff. But the actual pitch, what my boss had informed me I had to do is, hi, my name is Adam Duff. I'm calling from a company called the Carrie and Associates and we're currently conducting a survey among people in your area. And you're wondering if you only have a couple of minutes, it shouldn't take too long. Okay, the first question is blah, 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 blah. And you immediately throw into it as fast as possible. You don't give them a chance. And their belief in this was that if you go fast enough, you're speedballing them into answering questions before they even realize they don't want to do it. That was their attitude. And there was a, you, if you got the record number of completed surveys for that day, you'd win a prize. It could be, a, you know, some, you know, a free meal at blah, 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 or, you know, you know, a rebate at some gym or whatever, some, some, whatever random prize you got at the end of the day. And for the first couple of weeks, I tried it their way. And I would rush through it and guaranteed, you, after, you know, the, I would make about 600 calls a day. And out of those 600, I'd be lucky if one or two people actually stayed online to answer the surveys. And some of them kind of like caught, caught wind halfway through. I'd be like three quarters of the way through and then they'd just hang up on me. Because the, their experience on the other end of the line is, A, this guy's a scammer. He's trying to, he's trying to fast talk me. B, I have no emotional, personal connection to this person because they're speaking, I'm speaking to a robot. I'm speaking to something that doesn't feel natural. They're not communicating to me on a human level. Therefore, they're not human. And click, I can hang up on somebody who I have no emotional connection to. And my boss just, you know, you got to do it this way and go faster and you got to do it like that. And I'm sitting there going, and his record, I might add, his record total number of surveys, what got him the supervision job in the first place was the fact that he broke the record of 15 in one day. Good for him. The one day I said, you know what? This is a minimum wage ass job. And if I get fired tomorrow, I couldn't give a shit. So I decided to do it my way. I realized I could tell by my intuition that I was fast talking people too much. And the phone beeps and I say, hi. And I wait. And they said, hi. I said, my name is Adam Duff, full name, not hi, my name is Adam, welcome to blah, 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 no. My name is Adam Duff and I'd wait. I'm identifying myself fully to this person. This establishes trust. And there would be a second pause and they would go, hi, Adam Duff, in a sarcastic way. And I go, um, well, I'm calling because I'm doing a survey and I didn't name drop to carrying associates who gives a shit right i said i'm doing survey work for a surveying company and they go okay because i've t i've slowed them down I'm, I'm calling them at dinner time right and i go i'm doing a survey it usually takes about say around five to ten minutes depending um and it's nothing about it's nothing personal and if there are any questions that you feel are personal just tell me, you don't, you're not obliged to answer anything. You're perfectly, you're, you're under no obligation. You can just say, I don't feel like answering that. 
Do you have a couple of minutes? And this was my pitch. And my boss is looking at me going, dude, dude, that's not how you do it. And I swear to God, at least 75% of the time, the person said, yeah, sure, okay, cool. Because they knew who I was. I was a human. I, had, I, I was considerate of their feelings. I gave them a realistic timeline of how long it was going to take. And I let them know that they were safe. And my record that day was around 46 completed surveys. Okay. And that wasn't even close to what I ended up with by the time I left the place. And everybody else was struggling to get one or two. It was all about pacing. And nobody felt fast-talked, swindled, or like they were speaking to some robotic call center guy who you could easily hang up on. And if they did hang up on me, 99% of the time they said, I'm really sorry, Adam. And they would call me by my name. I'm sorry, Adam, but I just sat down with my, with my kids to eat. It's kind of bad timing. I'm like, yeah, sure. No problem. Have fun. Enjoy your meal. Take care. Bye, Adam. Bye. I'm sorry. I know. Yeah, no problem. They apologized for hanging up on me. My boss sat me down day after day after day and said, Adam, you, you really can't do it like that. And I said, I said, I respect the fact that it's your job to tell me that I need to be doing it a certain way, but I'll take my chances. I'll do it my way because it seems to be working. Maybe you could pass that message off to the rest of your staff <laughs> and you would have a very good reputation as a survey company, wouldn't you? And I said, but you've got your job. You're getting paid to do it this way. I totally respect that. And I told him if you don't feel I fit into the company culture, I will completely respect it if you decide you need to let me go. And he laughed and he said, it's cool. I'll let you know again tomorrow. And I said, okay, cool. And we both smiled and we went and we had a beer at the end of the day. And for the 12th day in a row, I got my free whatever. <laughs> my meal was always paid there because of that. Now, this is probably the most important thing I'm ever gonna share with you today, professionally. And that is your reputation. Arguably, everything that I've already said kind of ties into that, but this is something that I cannot stress enough. 100% of the time, 100% fact is that everything that you share online, your future employers, your future students, your future uh, clients are going to check out. Everything that you put on Facebook, everything you put on Instagram, everything you put on YouTube is your online, extremely candid, open to everybody, curriculum vitae. It's your CV. It's your resume. That's your reputation. Handle it with extreme care. Always be thoughtful with the information that you share. Always be thoughtful with the opinion and the delivery of that opinion that you share because nobody cares if you're right. Nobody cares if you're true. Nobody cares if you're on the right side of an argument or the right side of a tragedy or the right side of anything. If your delivery comes across the wrong way, if your attitude comes across the wrong way, for some strange reason, that job, that client, that sponsor, that student that you really truly do deserve won't call you or won't call you back. And you're going to look and say, I am so perfectly suited for that job. I have the artwork. I'm better than everybody else. I've got more experience. Why aren't they calling me back? They're not calling you back because they saw that YouTube video where you were bitching and complaining about something that you or at least you bitched and complained about it in the wrong way. Or maybe you just said something that really pissed a lot of people off, right? And you might have been completely right in sharing that opinion, but maybe your delivery was a bit too aggressive, a bit too noisy. It might have been something. From a friend-to-friend -friend perspective, and even from a YouTuber or a Facebooker or an Instagrammer to audience perspective, it was a big hit. From a professional perspective, you just burned your own bridge because everything that you share from an emotional, verbal, public level 
is a reflection now of the company that you work for. If I was to post some video with some crazy rant about um, how much I'm sick and tired of the bureaucracy of companies, hashtag company I'm working for, that reflects bad on the company and the company has to get their PR team to sit down and go, he does not represent the company's opinion. That has nothing to do with us. I have no idea what this idiot's going on about, but that's not, and they have to get freaking lawyers and spend money to defend their own reputation against some idiot who decided to post a video about Burger King foot lettuce, right? That big McDonald's employee, if you've ever watched top 15s, right? That, that, that employee potentially really damaged Burger King's reputation. And that kid might have gotten a couple of laughs out of it, but he has clotheslined his career moving forward. Because if anybody ever gets wind of that and he's applying for a thing and they go online to check out what he's done, they're not going to hire him. Do you, you think somebody, do you think a company's going to want to take a chance with that? There's also, if you're a YouTuber, there's sponsors, there are, you know, there are potential sponsors or collaborations or other YouTubers that might want to work with you. If you put your foot in your mouth, if you're somebody who's known for being whiny and complainy and tries to play the sympathy card too often, if you're somebody that's a little bit too aggressive and argumentative or you protest everything every two days, there's a very good chance people are going to say, you know what, I don't want to kind of be seen in the same light as this guy because I'm not, I'm a little bit more professional than that. And this guy, I do, I mean, I agree with him, but he's just, he's just too much. I don't want to collaborate with somebody like that because that's my name. When I, when I associate my name with somebody else, well, I'm basically saying I agree with this guy. I feel the same way. And you can be guilty through association in that regard. So no, I will not collaborate with people that have an unprofessional attitude. And this is considered very unprofessional. So whenever it is that you post artwork online or you're sharing an opinion online, well, artwork is artwork. Be Have as much integrity as you want with your artwork. But if it's a public opinion, if it's a, pu if it's a thought, if it's a, it's a, if it's a rant about some company, if it's talking about something that a, a, a applies to the industry as a whole, something that could come back and reflect on you on a professional level, be very thoughtful about how that's being received. Ask yourself the question. I always take a third person perspective on anything that I post online. And number one, think to myself, the, my number one priority, particularly for something like today where I'm sharing advice, is if somebody's parent, not the person, not the listener, but if that listener's parents, and I'm, I'm talking, whether I'm talking about somebody who's 55 or somebody who's, who's 12, if that person's parent listened to what I was sharing and thought to themselves, I don't like what this guy's teaching my kids, then I will pull that content or I just won't, I won't do it. I want to make sure that it holds up to the parent the mom and dad uh, judge because they don't want anybody walking in on their kid's life and messing around with their kid's professional attitude. So I want to offer advice that I would only offer my own children. And that keeps me very clean. I, I mean, I'll, I'll fuck bomb every now and then and I'll say shit once in a while, but that's not my point. I swear around my kids too sometimes. But more often than I should probably. <laughs> but it's the long-term impact that you're having on that person's professional attitude. And that's something I take hugely, hugely importantly. And if I know that if I can't completely stand behind everything that I share and know that what I'm sharing is sound advice, I will leave it out. Take that extra time and care because if you're wrong, you're going to pay for it. On a couple of occasions, I did consciously cross that line. And I did consciously complain and point a finger at somebody. Rightfully so. And when I do, I stand by it. The video I posted where I was sharing my thoughts and feelings about the future of Cintiqs, and I shared my opinion about uh, the, the uh, Terry Goodkind, the author who hired 
uh, Bastien de Couf d'Arme from France to produce an illustration and bashed him publicly and ridiculed him publicly for not having artwork that he felt held up to and throw, making a survey of people to troll him. My opinion of Terry Goodkind is I want everybody who watches that video and my opinion to never work for that asshole again. So I made sure that when I crossed that line, I stood behind it. I don't want anybody, any artist subject to a douchebag like that. So I stood behind that and I didn't take that video off. I left it there because I want as whenever there's an artist, a professional artist who Bastien incredibly is, is looking for a job and they go, wow, this is a very reputable uh, uh, author who's done a lot of fantasy art and stuff like that. And they're considering getting uh, taking a contract with him. I want my video to deter them from doing that. I want them to know what an asshole this guy is and, and the price they might have to pay publicly if they don't please this little dick. Okay, so I stand behind that. But I did so very carefully. And do I look back a couple of years later and think to myself, oh, fuck, I got to take that video on, video down. I really, I really burned my bridges. No, fuck him. I stand behind it. And I'm sure that anybody who watches that video as well will be grateful that I did it. But I'm putting my name behind that rant. Who you are and what you share with other people matters. And if you have developed a reputation being that kind of person who bitches and complains, unless... Bitching and complaining is what makes you money. If you are a whiner and a complainer YouTuber who makes millions of dollars a month from whining and complaining, then take the video down because your source of money is going to dwindle once that starts to become public. If you have any stuff that you've posted, I've posted a couple of videos online where I had a very strong opinion about something that I really believed in. I posted a video on sexism once when I got wind of two of my graduating students, both who graduated at the same time, equally qualified, working for the same company that were making a 50% difference in salary. I reacted and I posted a video about it. I ended up with death threats. I still stand behind my opinion, but I knew that YouTube wasn't the place for that. Okay, so I pulled the video down 24 hours later. I also pulled it down because my children were being threatened, right? I also learned a very important thing about sexism that day and just how much danger women can put themselves in when they try to stand up for themselves from the perspective that most men don't get. But that's a conversation for another day. I pulled it down because I knew that my channel is not a place to rant about sexism. It's an art channel where people come to get inspired, get some professional advice, some art tips, and that's it. And if I ever do decide to rebrand myself to being some whiner and complainer and I want to make millions of dollars doing that, I will do so. But until then, I take everything that I say seriously. And I really recommend you do the same thing too. Remember that your reputation is something that you have to carefully build and who you put your, your name behind and what you put your name behind matters. It always matters. So with that said, this has been a rather long video, so I definitely do appreciate you sticking it out this long, but hopefully there's some, some, something of value that you can take from this, and hopefully this is something that you can carry with you moving forward in a positive way to help your career flourish, and so that those employers feel confident putting the name behind you, all right? So once again, I love you with all my heart, happy painting, and I'll see you soon. Take care.